So the next thing we want to do to make this animated pop-up more reusable is to remove uh, the need for any of these styles. So at the moment, there's a few issues with using the styles. One is in order to animate, we have to explicitly set the width and height of the uh, pop-up in a style, which is not very usable and not very good for, say you want multiple pop-ups now, and different widths and heights. Or even you want one where the width and height is simply automatically calculated based on the content. Whereas at the minute we're having to set it here. So let's start by just removing styles, considering we know that's not going to be a viable option. And what we need to now mimic is this transition behavior. And I don't think there's currently a way to do transitions with, uh, say, percentages. Like you want the width and height to be 100%, for example, here. So that's kind of a shortfall at the minute with the styles. So let's just delete them. And now let's try and have this same behavior. So you can see straight away, we'll no longer need uh, classes, really, because that's the only thing the class is doing. And the class.open binding to whether the channel configuration list is open for now can just go. And we'll re-add that to our new control to potentially like an is opened uh, binding, something like that. But for now, let's just delete that. Uh, we don't need the name either because we're going to do this in an actual uh, controls code. Whereas at the minute, it's in this code behind. So all this code behind, what it's doing right now is setting the position of the pop-up which again, we will do in our code. So just so it stays where it is for now, actually, let's just leave that name in just for a moment, but it won't be needed once we move the position over as well. So with that deleted, you can see now the control is whatever size we put content in here. So if we just do say a stack panel, and in the stack panel, we put the label, and in fact, above that as well, let's just do a border, just as the overall control. And then let's just add some padding, something like 20 and make this background black for now, or let's do white. And let's just do a border and a border brush of gray. Uh, chuck some corner radius on there. And now on the label, we can just get rid of the style. So just something like that for now. And if we just place in a few of those. You can see that's the size the control wants to be. And that will change based on content. So there's no hard defined width and height now. And we want to animate this in and out. So to do that, we can go to the code behind of the actual content control. And let's just create a new constructor and then here what we'll do is just have the animation run on uh, creation basically and then we can move that afterwards to a attach property or style property whatever we find works best and bind it to like an is opened property to start and reverse the animation but to start with we need to just get the animation actually working and get the size of the control so we'll do this incrementally and we'll just chuck in the code to get it working, then clean things up, move things around and grow the control in stages. So instead of trying to make this all in one, working for everything, we'll literally design this to just work for our one need for now and expand on it as needed. That allows us to get this up and running nice and quickly and improve on it going forward. So we're just literally directly in the constructor for now, let's try and get this thing animated. So I know one thing we need is the size of this control, which I believe is desired size if it's like WPF. So it gets it during the measurement pass. So the likelihood is this desired size is not going to be set in the constructor. So let's just make a private member of size. So this will store the desired size of the control. And then I know for a fact it's not going to show up in the constructor. But just to test that, we can just debug into this and run and see what we get. So 
And you can see here the desired size is zero. So the first question is, where do we get the desired size from? Well, we want to override the controls render, I would have thought. We have render, arrange, override, and arrange call. Those are the things that actually uh, decide what size it wants to be. We don't want to interfere with that. We just want to know what size it was. But if you look at the main view as well, we override render here which is when we expect sizes to change. And we've kind of seen that that happens. So similarly, we're just moving this to uh, inside the controls own render. So if we override the render here, we can set the desired size. And this should only fire like before, anytime the control changes. So we should find now, there's the desired size, 124 width by 249 high. And then you can see it's grown there to 144 after, so it's done two calculations, probably after a second pass. And then I presume if we drag, it's going to fire again, but the size is already the same. So this looks like the place to get the desired size. Now I'm not sure what's going to happen to this when we animate. This desired size will almost very likely actually get changed because we're going to directly be changing the size which then means the desired size is going to alter so we might have to do something where if we are in an animation loop we ignore this in fact i'm pretty sure we will so let's just already add like a boolean um m animating something like that a flag for when we are animating and let's just say, uh, if we are animating, then, in fact, if we are not animating, then we update the new size. So that this will only ever hopefully update with the relevant size, but we'll see that. We can even just log out to the console as well. Uh, when this changes just for now so we can see it so let's just do console.write line desired size and we'll just print that out so then if we start this we should see we're currently never animating so this should fire all the time and there's the size and we resize this control and you can see it's always that size. So, so far, that's fine. So we know we don't need to set it here. It's pointless. But what we do want to do here now is let's try and get some animation working. So for that, we can just do a timer. And once we bind to a property that flags whether you want to effectively open or close and animate those transitions, uh, we can start a timer off, but we're just going to do this on open for now. So we'll have a, I don't know, 60 frames per second timer because we are going to be directly setting the uh, controls width. So the quicker we do it, the smoother it will be. But for now, let's just do a uh, 60 frame per second timing. So let's first work out the span of that, which would be uh, frame rate, I guess we'll call it. And the frame rate will be time span um, from seconds, and we want 1 60th of a second, so that will be 60 frames per second. Get a 60 FPS time span. So that's going to give us effectively a time span object that will contain the information about how long 1 60th of a second is. Uh, that might want to be 0 0.0, so we're not dividing by an integer. There we go. Then for a timer, we can do our timer equals new timer. But this will just run on the thread pool. And the problem with the thread pool is once we come back to set the width of the control, we're not on the UI thread. But just like WPF, we have a dispatcher timer, which means it's just like a timer. But when the callback gets called, we are on the dispatcher thread, which is the thread that updates the UI. 
So it's effectively like a UI based loop, which is what we want. So we'll just make a new dispatch timer. And now for a timer to run, we have to have an interval set. So this is how frequently you want the timer to constantly tick over and do something. And that is currently expected to be a time span. So we can literally pass in the frame rate. Set the timer to run 60 times a second. And then to listen to that call, we can do timer.elapsed or ticked or something. Tick, there we go. Plus equals sender and event args. And now in here, this tick should run uh, once every 60 seconds. So we'll just output a right line with, uh, I don't know, something incrementing. Let's just do var i equals zero, i plus plus, just as a quick update. Timer tick, and then i. And then if we run that, let's see if we get a timer ticking. And we don't, and of course we have to start the timer. I always forget that step. Uh, start timer. This will be callback on every tick. And we'll clean this up and move it out of the constructor, obviously, when we're done. But again, as I mentioned for now, just literally uh, let's get this working directly and simply when it loads. So timer dot start. And this timer will just run infinitely. It will never stop until we tell it to stop. But we'll fix that once we're animating. So there you can see, if you counted seconds, you should increment 60 numbers every second. That's the timer running, which is what we want. So now what do we want to do inside of this timer? We effectively want to animate for a certain period of time, and we want it to go from zero to the current desired uh, size of the control in both directions, width and height. So we're getting the desired size already. Now we just need to work out, well, one, we need to limit this timer to run for so long. So let's figure that out first. And then we could pass in the duration just like the animation was originally, so that the end user can say you want the animation running for a certain number of seconds. But for now, we'll just hard code that. So we can get rid of the plus for now. And what we want is, oh yeah, you can do object initialization, which is easier. So that looks nicer. There we go. Um, what we want to do is uh, figure out, we want to, pass in seconds, which I'm thinking, do we just do it right now and make, no, let's get this working first, but then we'll probably uh, expand that. So let's just fix it for now. Fix for three seconds. So total or, I don't know, animation time equals uh, time span dot from seconds three. Now from that, we need to work out how many ticks it's gonna be before three seconds has elapsed. So that would be total ticks equals, and then we will need to get the frame rate in time and see how many times it fits into the animation time. So for that, we will have to do uh, animation time dot total, no seconds will do divide by the frame rate, total seconds. I think that will tell us how many ticks we need to do. And we can just round that up to an integer. So if we had a total animation time of three seconds, and let's say the frame rate was once a second, that would be three divided by one, which is three, which would be right. If it was half a second frame rate, ticking twice a second, it would be three divided by 0.5, which is six, which is right. So this should be, uh, get the total, or calculate rather, 
calculate total ticks that make up the animation time. So now we know the total ticks, we need to store uh, the current tick. So keep track of current tick. And this will be reset every time the animation resets. So we'll do current tick as zero for now. And then in the timer, we can simply do current tick plus plus. And if we have reached the total ticks, so if current tick is greater than total ticks, uh, we will first stop the timer so it doesn't continue to run. And we can reset the current tick back to zero if we want. Now, we might not want to do this because we'll probably go in reverse after. So, in fact, yeah, we would. And then we'll do the logic to go backwards and forwards. But for now, we just do timer.stop. And let's just log that out again. Let's keep track of if this is working. Uh, do current tick. And log that out. So let's just run that and see if we get uh, 180 ticks, I think it is, for three seconds. And we do. And you can see here we get to the 181st. So you probably want to do a return for now to stop uh, any code that comes after this from running until we figure out what we're doing with the reverse animation. So there's now our timer, a little run for the time we want. So we're now free in here to uh, do our animation, I guess. Increment the tick. Stop this animation timer. Breakout of code. Right, so now what do we do every tick? All we need to do now, it's pretty simple, it is to change the width of this control. So we just need to do the width and the height equals some value. So for example, just for quickness to see if we see anything, we could just do width equals current tick. And let's just run that and we should actually see the control animating in the width. It'll be completely random, it'll be literally the size of the timer, but you can see now we have an animation. If we do that for height as well, we should see an animation, obviously not the same as what we want and not the right size, but we should literally have an animation. So all we need to do to complete this animation is to uh, get a percentage of the way through the uh, ticks we are. So the total ticks divide by the current ticks and get a percentage and then multiply the desired width and height by that percentage to get a linear animation. So let's start with that. So let's just do uh, percentage animated. And that is just current ticks divided by total ticks. And that will be a percentage from zero to one, which is fine for them multiplying. So get percentage of the way through the current animation. Now we want to get uh, calculate final width and height. And that is as easy as now just going uh, final width equals the desired size dot width times the percentage animated. Do that for the height. And this should now at least give us the actual original width and height that we animate back to. And something's clearly gone wrong there. So I can see desired size has changed 40 to 30. So desired size, oh, we haven't set the animating flag, so that's exactly what's happened. We've calculated the desired size. We've gone one size into the tick, set it to zero. The desired size has then changed and then we're trying to animate to a constantly changing size. So if that was the case, we'd want to, in here, set animating flag. Uh, 
And when we're done, clear animating flag. Let's try that again, see if that works. Still no. So something is wrong with our calculation. So let's see. So we get to here, current ticks is one, total ticks is 180, and percentage is an integer. Why is percentage an integer? Because both of these are integers. So we just want to do, cast one of them to a float, and that will make the actual calculation turn into a float on the animation. And there we go, now we have an actual percentage. And uh, let's start that again. And this should work. There we go, so you can see that's now animating in three seconds to where we start. So that's now animating out, which is fine. But what about that original effect we had, the quadratic ease in and out? Well, that is really simple to do, and that just involves making, again, for now, um, directly in code, uh, make an animation easing. And we did, I think it was uh, quadratic. Was it called quadratic? I think it was quadratic easing or something like that. Quadratic easing, there we go. So we have this helper in Avalonia, and we'll use the quadratic easing. And all we need to do on that is this just takes all these um, animation classes do is take in a number and calculate it based on a percentage. So they all just have this ease property and they take in progress. And from the progress, they calculate the real position in the progress. So they take and say position one, 1% 1 of the animation, and then you give us back another percentage that's where it would be at that phase in the curve. So all we have to do to use that is change the percentage animated directly to easing.ease and pass in the real percentage as a linear curve, and this ease will return another percentage in the curve that matches whichever one we want to use. So if we do this on both of these, we should now get the similar effect to what we had before, just obviously a lot slower. So you can see how that grows and then speeds up. So if we were to speed this up now, and probably, I think it was 0.17 we used, we're more than likely not gonna get to see that because it's going to happen so quick at the minute on just pop up. But let's just see if we can see it. So you just about see it. But the animation's working, we have what we want. But that's the animation effectively working without the need for styles now that will grow to whatever size the control currently is. So I think that's right. It looks a bit more like it's gone over here, to be honest. The size doesn't look quite right there. So I wonder if that second desired size was, what would it be? We have an animation, the timer comes in. Yeah, before we did that, we got two calculations. So let's just also do this double check a moment. If M desired size, uh, isn't equal to null, if it can be null. No, it can't be null. Uh, isn't equal to size.empty. Set the size. So only update the size once. And let's see if that first size that it gives us is right. No. Ah, and also we're starting to animate before we get the size. That's another problem. 
Um, so that actually probably is the problem. We don't want to start the animation here at the start. We can start the animation once the size updates for now. So again, this is where we will uh, progressively improve this code as we go. Uh, move this to a private member. So in constructor, we now do that. We set it all up in here. We stop it there and we can now start the timer once we get a size. Right then, so what's going wrong here? Oh, I've done desired size as the variable, not the actual size of the control. So, right, desired size isn't equal to zero. It's going to be that first value for now. It'll come back and, ah, that's also not what we want because that's now going to set that again. Let's just see what that does anyway. Yes, that's growing too big, you see. But what we want to do is ignore that second pass. So where that isn't empty and um, desired size is empty. So it's never been set before. And then we'll try and figure out afterwards what that second pass is where the render size is larger than it should be. Yeah, so that first pass has worked fine. And that's the original size we want. So I'm not sure what the second size is just yet. And to be honest, we don't really care too much now. What do the new desired size? Only once. Note, unsure of what the second measure pass adds to the size. But for now, ignore it. And it could be something to do with uh, the code here setting this margin, which to be honest, it could be. So let's just return from there and not set the margin. And let's just see in here if we do get that second pass or not. And if so, we know uh, the margin is somehow affecting the final size and we might have to remove a margin. This might be including a margin. So desired size is currently the 124. Yeah, and it never gets set again. So the actual fix would be, um, the correct fix now, is the desired size must include the margin. And we're going to have two things happen here. If we're not animating, we're not going to update the size, which is wrong. It's because of when we decide to animate in and out. So at the minute, we're just animating based on a time. So let's ignore the fact that this is going to double animate for now. And we'll just kick off the animation each time by directly setting the current tick. So let's also move that to a private property as well. So private int um, current animation tick or m animation current tick. The current position in the animation. So in the constructor, get set to zero. Every tick it animates and when it's above, it stops and we calculate the percentage. So for now, we're gonna hit this twice fairly quick and it's gonna restart the animation from zero. So you might see a little stutter, but that's fine for the minute until we move this off to not start until we're well past the initialization. So this will now call in twice. And to be honest, that check isn't even needed either because we don't really care now 
what the desired size is, that's the size we want. We now know this is including the margin. So we want to remove um, the margin, which is, of course, a thickness. Can it do a size minus a thickness? Yes, it can. It looks like it, so maybe that works. So let's run this now and see if the desired size recalculates correctly. So the first one is 1, 2, 4 with a margin of 20 and 15. Then one is 144 with a margin of 20, 15. And the second pass then becomes the exact size. And now it scales correctly. So you can see there was a point in time in between that where the margin was set from here, but the desired size was not updated yet. And on the second pass, it then corrected itself. So now, we have an animation that starts and is exactly the size of the original control. So we just go back in here and you can see it even works here or kind of did. Now we sort of broke that animation. Hmm. So it doesn't like this. Um, this UI here at the minute this is just automatically rerunning. But again, this is sort of mid-creation at the minute, so we're not just going to do it on construction constantly. So let's ignore that that's broken at the moment anyway. And run the actual code. And you can see it works here. So that's now working how we want. And the next step will be, I think now, to make the starting of the animation bind to a property is opened. So in here, in this animated pop-up here, we could do is opened equals and then bind it to our property that then opens with a button press. So that will be the thing we do next, but for now, we've removed the need for the styles. And then after that, we'll remove the need for this pop-up closer. And then we'll have a pretty clean animation control we can use to put anything inside of it that animates it's opening and closing. So that's it for this one. That was fairly smooth and worked. And in the next one, we'll add the as opening ability to bind to this control and possibly even do the injection of this pop-up closer.